Some nice music. Yes, it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, nice to have you here, Andreas. How are you? Thank you very much. Um, this is a bit impromptu, but uh, it's going to be fun. So. Yes. Uh, great. Um, I, I know that I'm not famous enough to make the original lineup, so that's oh okay. no, that's 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 totally <laughs> fine. Um, I, I guess we have uh, lots of questions, and I really want to understand myself. How do I impress a VC, right? Um, but before that, could you dive a little bit deeper into why you are here and and pretty much um, what's your background? Why are you? Why do you have the expertise to tell us how to impress <laughs> a VC? You know, um, because I am a VC, um, no, and that's and that's literally the only thing I know. So um, my journey and uh, and Kim already alluded to that a little bit earlier is. Uh, I'm German, I studied industrial engineering, I spent six months of my life on a factory shop floor in China, um, which was a lot of fun, but also um, not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And then was very fortunate that I could join Project A, which is an early stage fund out of Berlin, um, at a time when they were just effectively getting started on their VC model. I was the first uh, analyst to join the team, I was incredibly junior. Um, and that's now almost nine years ago, and I've been doing absolutely nothing else besides VC um, properly for the rest of my career. Um, and now with Atomico for the last three and a half almost years. All right. How many pitches do you hear per year? Oh, that's a good question. I should have looked into the data. I was asked this question this morning, actually, as well. Um, I, so as a team in total, it's several thousand. Um, and we ran the numbers, so I met with around 500 organizations this year so far. That includes our VCs, right? So it's probably like a third of that, and the rest is probably startups. So um, that's me personally. But as a team, we see a lot. We're a generalist Series A investor. Um, we love our, as, as you mentioned in the introduction, we love our, we all, all, all partners, we all have our individual focus areas, but as a whole, we're a generalist fund. And so we have to cover the entirety of the landscape. And therefore, there's a lot of meetings that come out of that. Um, and also a lot of no's, unfortunately, which is, uh, which is the, the part about this job that I dislike the most. All right, so now pretend I'm a founder and yeah. I really want to impress you. First impression, I've never seen you before. So how do I make a top impression, first impression to a VC? I hope you're going to start a business and we, <laughs> then we properly have to talk. Um, so um, I think there's one thing that I really value in founders' journeys and that's authenticity, right? Like, you can be a very much an introvert, you can be very much an extrovert, you can be coming from an industry background, you can be a whiteboard founder who explored different industries and then settled on a specific problem to solve. All of that is very valid in itself. And I think you can really, like once you've seen many pitches, you can really sense where people make up stories or like try to fudge things that are not really their true beliefs and their true um, yeah, their true intentions of why they started the business, etc. So I always really value like an authentic story um, that, yeah, that comes up that is of course well presented. I think there is certainly a storytelling element to it, but that story element or storytelling element should also fit to your own personality. So I think above all, this is authenticity and like really being who you are as a founder because you don't want to raise capital from people who will think you're someone else. Um, so be authentic and I think that's, that always leaves a great impression. Be honest about the challenges that you're facing. I think that's, if everything's crystal clear, everything's perfect, that's never the case, right? Like, so being authentic also about the challenges that you're facing. That shows a good understanding for it. You can make a great case out of why you're what they want to overcome these challenges. So being honest, being authentic, being humble. I mean, you're setting out to achieve hopefully a really great, great vision. So there's, there's a little bit of, uh, of strong ambition and uh, maybe sometimes even slight delusion and slight naivety, which is great, um, needs to be in that. But, um, but I think sort of this like humbleness around like, hey, building a startup is incredibly tough. And nothing is gonna fall. Nothing is gonna fall into place. You need to make things fall into place. So it's the yeah, authenticity, being humble, and being honest about the challenges that you're facing. Do I impress you better with my authenticity, humbleness, <laughs> online or in person? You. Um, uh, Collectively speaking, <laughs> not me personally. <laughs> uh, I think I think you all, as the slush team, you are just like very 
dry Finnish people who just like to do more than talking. And I think that's that's uh, that's what this entire conference embraces. And it's a bit ironic that now we're sitting on stage and talking. But um, but uh, no, it's it's authentic. Like you're the same person online as you are in real life. So okay, that's, great. That's um, great. That's why I want you to start a business. It's going to be my going to be my challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, if we now move on, right? So I impressed you. I hopefully get to the second meeting and we have more and more chats and potentially we end up working together and I'm raising funding from Atomico. That's great. I'm hopefully here manifesting my future, <laughs> knock on wood. Um, but if, you, if we now proceed, right? So you have invested into, into my startup in this case um, and I really want to develop the relationship further. So I now have an existing investor. Um, what are the do's that I should do that make you and the fund love me even more? Yes, um, so multiple things in this question, I think. So the first thing is just speaking to us really helps. Um, when I was, uh, I, may, I may throw him under the bus here, but uh, when I was at Project A, there was one partner who once in a media interview said something on the, along the lines of, hey, if founders don't reply to us, that's what makes us really excited and we want, want to chase them even further. Um, which for me as a VC junior, as an analyst, made my life really hard because people just stopped replying to me. So I think the first thing I would counter what uh, this uh, former boss of mine effectively said is, I think there's an element of nurturing these relationships that is very important. So for us, we are not a super early stage fund. So we don't necessarily do pre-seed. We come in around like late seed series A is where our bread and butter really starts. So usually you would have an investor before and usually you would have a little bit of time along your journey that has already gotten into this. So along this journey and I appreciate very much that as a founder, you have so many things to do, right? Like you have a business to run, you have people to hire, you have customers calling you, particularly in the beginning, you're wearing so many different hats. Um, and then taking time out of your day to actually speak to investors and like keep them updated about the journey can be a really, really tough thing to do. What I, um, what I advise my founders to is just like take one call a week, that's half an hour, just to catch up with people, just to build like a book of people that are interested in your business, keep them engaged, keep them along the journey. That just makes it much, much easier. You can pause that, right? Like if you have an important strategic decision, maybe you're going to pivot or slightly change your business model, then maybe around that time you don't really want to speak because you first want to make up your mind. That's totally fine. So it's not prescriptive. Um, but generally building that relationship really, really helps. And we've seen that also with, the fund, with our founders who then go on to fundraise. It really helps if you have built up a book of excited investors about you. So first thing, just speaking and building the relationship. I think that is, that is very, very important. And then it's basically a continuation of what I said before, right? So you're telling about your challenges. You're telling, telling, about, telling about the things that you're facing. I think what's always great is when founders exhibit like a strong understanding of the journey. It's like, okay, here's where I am. Here's the challenges that I'm having. In the next six months, I want to prove that I can also sell to a customer outside of my initial ideal customer profile. Maybe in the beginning, I'm just selling to startups and I want to prove that I can sell to someone else besides startups, just as a random example. So really understanding your growth journey, showing your progression along the way. There's a big element of just expectation management of like, if you deliver what you're saying, you're going to deliver. Like if you say, well, you're going to be at 1 million ARR end of the year, and you're actually going to be at 1 million ARR at the end of the year. That's what makes me as a easily excitable person, um, very excited about just someone who has an understanding on this growth journey. And we, and that might be different for pre-seed funds who meet you earlier along the journey. We have this luxury of being able to build a relationship with founders over time. And therefore, we have many data points. We see how founders grow. They get to know us. I think it's just a much better start into an actual founder-investor relationship versus you get into a process, you have to close in a week or even, maybe even less. That's just not a great start. I think both parties need to get to know each other. And I think, therefore, nurturing, building that relationship is really important to both sides, even though I very much understand as a founder, you're thinking about the next problem that you're going to solve at hand. And, Customers pinging you left, right, and center, and someone's quitting, and you have to hire that person, and um, it's it's busy. But taking a capped, very capped amount of time out of your busy schedules to do that actually makes sense. And I realize this is a very self-serving answer, of course, because we also want to build that relationship. But um, yeah, that's that would be my my thinking. 
I'd like to double click on the on the topic. So basically, my concern would be that if I'm very open to you and update you weekly on all the challenges I face, wouldn't you start to see me in potentially in the image of, yeah. oh, this guy doesn't have anything under control? Um, <laughs> that, could that potentially lead to the VC looking at me negatively? How do I balance those those two things? Maybe not every single challenge, right? So if you've worked in a startup, you know that a challenge can be whatever. People are arguing of which sort of tea to order for the office, whatever, or which blend of coffee. Like that's that's maybe not something to talk about with your investors about. But with like the strategic challenges of like, as I was saying, right? Like we think a lot in proof points. Um, like getting your first customer, getting your first revenues, that's a great proof point. So, and if you don't have that, well, it's a challenge to get there. So being honest about these things. And then, then the next proof point is like getting a bunch of customers, maybe different customer segments, because you want to prove that you cannot only sell to a specific customer group, but also to another customer group. Then maybe getting like a repeatable go-to-market motion in place of like where you have a sales team, you can predictably, if you throw leads into the funnel, you produce revenue in the end. These are like proof points. These are the challenges sort of that, that I think it's always great and encouraging to hear and the thing is investors should know not saying all investors know but investors should know that building an early stage startup is so challenging and if everything would be great well everyone would be doing it and it's a really really hard job to do and uh, therefore there will always be challenges and I personally think and maybe that's a personal view and other VCs would think differently but I I think it's great to sort of like own these challenges and like say okay so I need to prove that I can acquire a customer out of my initial ideal customer profile. I'm going to do that by talking to XYZ. I have these leads maybe already in the pipeline and I want to deliver on that until XYZ. That's great. That's like owning a challenge. If we now go, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm, <laughs> I'm just very curious. So basically, if, if I'm now the founder and we have those weekly check-ins and I'm sharing with you my strategic challenges, um, However, I start to misbehave outside <laughs> of your expectations. Where, wh what does uh, misbehaving mean? That's the question I want to get <laughs> to. So pretty much, are there any things that founders should never, ever do when collaborating and trying to nurture the relationship with the existing investor? Yeah, very good question. I think there is... Um, so not hitting the expectations like if you say you're going to hit whatever a million ARR at the end of the year and you're not hitting that like we know that this is going to happen right like we know that you're like a, a growth journey is never linear or never fully exponential only if you zoom out at the very end very much but in that moment it's never like that so it's very much not hitting your growth plans i think it's more really true misbehaving and like the true sense of the word is like really is if it's just misconduct right like if you're if you're misleading me and you're like you, you one day you say oh i have 500k arr and then you're going to raise around 12 months later and i look at the numbers and actually at this point in time you actually didn't have any revenues at all like i think this is where borderline starts to become investor fraud and this is where things really start to get worse um so i think that's one that's one thing all types of allegations of like how to, how you create the company culture etc so i think that's like really true misbehaving which is a becoming a red flag and then there's anything in between right like if you don't hit your growth targets well of course it's not necessarily a positive thing but it can be reasons for that so if you can explain that if you can put that into context etc that's not necessarily a red flag even though it not, might not be a positive thing it's not a misbehaving in its true sense i would say if we now go a step back right so i i just raised the funding um, and my key focus was I want funding from a VC. That, that's why I, I had the first impression. Yeah. That's how I impressed you. And then we built a relationship. But um, there's many other reasons to raise funding from a VC and many more value adds besides, besides the actual funding. Could you quickly just summarize of why else are we working together between as the founder and the VC? Yes. Um, I think maybe even before that, I'm going to say something that's slightly controversial. I think VC is not for everyone. I think raising VC capital is, is really like you should be incredibly clear about what your growth journey is going to be. And if you want to build a nice, small, profitable 10 people business, that's perfectly fine and it's great, but it's just VC is not the right form of financing for you. So really being intentional about 
your funding journey is very important. So, and if you go down the VC route because you want to create a really massive generational company, um, then VC is the right type of funding for you. But I think even before, even before that, what you were saying is like even it's really, it's really important to make up your mind that VC is really what you want as a form of financing and it really fits to your funding journey. And then sort of like re with regards to the value, I would bucket this into two items. One is like the classic core competencies of an investor, right? Like, so we are, as board members, we are, and we can get, dive into the, into the details of that, we give like some form of strategic advice, we can connect you to people, to customers at the right point in time, et cetera. Um, we're well, going to look over your financials, we're going to provide a certain form of governance, of course. Um, so I think there's like this core investor value proposition element um, that needs to be right, and there's varying, varying degrees of how well this can be executed. Happy to go into the details on that. Um, and then there's the other element. Lots of VCs, they come with a platform team, and it's become sort of this like ongoing running joke uh, amongst founders like VCs. They always claim to be helpful, but they never really actually are. Um, and when it comes to sort of this platform team, this is something that lots of people are saying. And I really want to counter this and say like, hey, if you have a VC that really has a strong platform team, and of course I'm tooting my own horn here, but we have like a 12 people platform team of people who have built up Snowflake in Europe from zero to 250 million ARR, fantastic go-to-market leader, people who've seen the talent function grow from zero to one to 20 people on the talent team. These are just like fantastic people that you can learn from. And that's like, we call it growth acceleration, other people might call it platform, but this is sort of the second bucket of more operational, more functional advice that you can get from an inv investor or also not get from an investor if you don't want to. That's also completely fair, by the way. You mentioned the board, right? Um, yes. Am I forced to have you on my board if I raise funding for you? <laughs> um, it depends on the stage. So where we usually invest, you're never forced, because I, I don't like these words, but uh, we would generally love to take a board seat, yes. Um, because we think that, well, at a certain point and where we invest, right, like there's at least some indication of product market fit. There's big debates around whether you need to have a board really before you found true product market fit or where it's rather like you need to tinker and find it for yourself. I think everyone needs to find the right model for them. But once you've reached that, once it's more about like creating a certain repeatability, establishing processes, and I think to establishing processes, there's like a, even though it's sometimes a bit of a bad word, but it's like there's a certain governance, like you've seen that with the open AI board, et cetera, what, all the things that can happen, and it's not pro probably not the, uh, not the very best example of how a board should be working, but like there's a certain element of governance, a certain element of oversight that should be happening. And usually these board meetings should be, and that brings us to another point, this should be most valuable to the founders. Like I see this as a service offering, if you will, to the founders. There's an element of classic oversight and we need to see some reporting on like how revenues have grown, how like cash in the bank has developed, et cetera. We need to see that, of course. But then it's much more about strategic guidance on like what do we think about a certain topic, giving maybe a little bit of inspiration to the founders never being prescriptive. I think VCs have this tendency sometimes and I tend to hold back if I see that in myself because I'm very guilty of that sometimes myself to extrapolate from a too small sample size. So if one portfolio company who did one thing really well and you're thinking, okay, now this is the next thing that you're going to preach to every of your portfolio companies, it's not true. Like everything is super context dependent. It still might be a good inspiration and maybe you can connect the two companies. But um, Giving the strategic advice, I think, is helpful. You can discuss certain things. What should we be focusing on? What should we not be focusing on? How do we prioritize? How do, you, do we find the right sequence? Are we first going to internationalize? Are we first going to sell into different customers' groups that we hadn't sold, sold to before? So all of these like more focusing, sequencing type of discussions are usually a great place to do at the board. Who should I have on my board in the first place? Is it, is it just the <laughs> investors I raise from? Do I get external people? How, how do I know as a first time founder, who should I have on the board? Because we've seen yes. ourselves recently, there's, the board has immense power. So yeah. how, how do I make those decisions? Um, first of all, and above all, it should only be people that you have like a good relationship to and people that you trust. I think that's above all things that's most important, which comes, comes back to the forcing, right, that you mentioned earlier. Like, if it feels forced to you, 
then we probably shouldn't do this. But if you want this, and if you think this can be valuable, then, well, that's a good starting point. So um, I think, first of all, like, this is like a just base layer of trust, of like, mutual appreciation that needs to be established. Otherwise, it's never going to work, and it's never going to be successful, and it's going to be horrible for everyone involved. Um, and then I think sort of like along the classic journey, like in the beginning, you have the founders on the board and you might have a pre-seed or seed investor, like whoever is the largest of them. Um, and then you might have a series A investor and like in every round you add like one or two, maybe one observer, because sometimes people like to have that. Um, and then the board grows and grows over time. I personally, and that's now maybe a slightly controversial opinion as well, I think there's a merit to having a certain board size and not having it too big because sometimes if you're if you're then in a room with 10 plus people it's really hard to find conclusions so keeping it small keeping it to a circle of people that you really trust i think renders merit for founders um because you can still reach out like if there's a specific topic from your other investors that you want input on you can still reach out to them I think at some point, somewhere around Series A, Series B, usually you start to see independent board directors like founders or operators who have been through the journey to, can take on a chairman role, can be like a non-executive board director, can become really helpful, can become really meaningful, very context dependent, very dependent on that person, um, shouldn't get someone just for the sake of getting someone. I think that's generally never, the, never, never good. Um, but I think this is like how a board, board journey evolves, like is guest established with the seed round or with the Series A rounds, and then sort of like it grows from there. And there's also periods of where you probably need to cut your board, um, uh, make it a bit smaller, and have to hopefully a collaborative discussion with your investors around that, um, just to keep the, the, the discussion quality high. Small board, are we talking three people, four people, five Dep people? Depends on whatever works, right? I've, I've seen five as a good size. Usually I have two founders, two, three investors maybe, depending on stage, of course, right? Like that, that's roughly where, where I see it, is a good equilibrium. Maybe one or two observers if, you th if investors want that and if you think that these observers can add value. Um, but yeah, um, I generally think that smaller boards yield better discussions and um, I'm happy to be bumped off the board at some point as well, right? Like it's, it's a journey. If founders want me, I'm very happy to stay on board. If there's no reason for me being there, I'm also happy to step out. So I think it's, it needs to be sort of this like mutual taking on this journey together and find whatever works for all parties involved. I, we have a couple of minutes left. I'd like to yes. kind of finish it off with going even more into the practicalities of, of working yeah. now, deepening my investor relations through the work that, that you do on my board. Um, so how often do we have board meetings? How, how do I structure them? Yeah. And, and how do I prepare for them as a founder to maximize my investor relations that we have through the board's work? Yeah. Once again, this is very personal and you need to find whatever rhythm works for you. But what I've seen work, and I hope that by sharing that I'm not prescriptive, but that's what I've seen works really well, is um, sharing a pre-read of materials, like exactly the reporting that I mentioned, right? Like you want to report on your revenues, you want to report on the number of customers, you want to report on your churn, whatever metrics you have, you want to report on changes on the team, you want to report on strategic changes, uh, et cetera, key achievements, key things that didn't go so well. Sending out a pre-read can be a doc, can be a deck, whatever format works for you. Um, sending that out a couple of days before the board meeting, make all investors really read that. I think if you're on a board, you have a responsibility toward a company reading that. And I've been in too many boards where investors started reading that like within the board meeting and that shouldn't really not be the case. I have funny st side story. I have one portfolio company. They included a link in their deck of like, hey, please input. They're raising some working capital facility. Please input all the contacts providing working capital that you have. And then they linked to a Google Sheet and they did not give the investors access to the Google Sheet. So they would basically see that only the ones who request access to the Google Sheet have actually read the document. So it was a funny little little check that they did. But really make investors read that deck before because otherwise like you're gonna not going to have a great discussion. 
then start off with like any sort of like Q&A, any questions that come out of that, 20, 30 minutes, maybe an hour, whatever works well. And then pick one, two, three core areas where you as a founder really, really would like input on. Can be a strategic prioritization, like are we going to go international now or are we going to solve these or these challenges first? can be like a discussion around product, can be a discussion around hiring, like when should we introduce like a VP layer, the C layer, C level additions, and how should we approach that? So there's probably like some challenges that are front of mind where you as a founder would love to get some input on. And I would really pick these areas of like, okay, these are the things on my mind, dear boards, happy to discuss. And then you have a discussion around these specific topics. I think that works really well. And then, after the boards, there is usually like a, well, not usually, sorry, but um, one, of, one of the portfolio founders, and big shout out to Thomas from Vey, um, who has introduced that and is like, I've been now been preaching this maybe a little bit too much, um, is to do like an all shareholders call after the board as well, because we have probably have angel investors, smaller funds, et cetera, at some point throughout the journey, and you want to keep them engaged and you can send them the reporting, but just get them for 30 minutes in a room, like do a little Q and A, give like a 10, min 10 minutes presentation, get all of their input. You have them on your cap table for a reason, right? Yeah. You're not letting them in just because they wire the money, because, but because they have contacts of value um, and put them to the test. And I think that's, that's really it. And sorry, you mentioned Cadence. Um, roughly quarterly is what we've seen works best, but like in the end, it doesn't really matter, but uh, quarterly works best. It can be every two months, it's fine. Um, and then catch-ups in the meantime, right? Like, investor to founder relationships, board relationships, if they only happen within the board meeting, then they're probably a bit dysfunctional. So they should happen throughout this entire journey. Outside of that, you can do that with regular catch-ups, you can do that async, I do both with my portfolio companies. Um, all of that works, um, but it board meet, like investor, if you only interact in the board, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, and the other thing I really wanted to say, like as we're nearing, towards the end of it, like really put your investors to the test, like as founders. I think that's one of the things where I'm always like, sometimes getting almost a little bit confused of like you get the investors in for providing the value and then afterwards you're saying, ah, they didn't really provide that value, but really put them to the test, ask questions, ask, hey, oh, I'm going to look for benchmarks on whatever, what percentage of my staff at my stage should be engineering versus sales. Like that's something that we can provide good input on. You should put us to the test like, hey, I'm, I'm looking to hire this and this function. Can you recommend three people who are doing it well so I can calibrate what good, good looks like? like? Really put your investors to the test and we're really happy to help, like uh, genuinely. And um, I would love for founders to do that more in the diligence phase, actually, as well. And also after that, like we're super happy to roll up our sleeves, literally, um, and um, work together with founders very closely. So put us to the test, please. Thank you so much for jumping in here today. Um, Thank you for having and me. And I know where to go when, yeah. when I start my company. <laughs> Please start a company. That's great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much.